welcome you all and, uh, to our second session um, of the uh, Center for Special Studies um, series on health, disease, and environment, world history. And um, this is the first where we have had a pre-distributed paper. And that's been the model for the next um, uh, the rest of the year, um, having uh, papers ahead of time, um, a contextualization by the author, a comment from a, from a OSU scholar, and then throw it open for, for comment. Um, so uh, what I want to do is, is obviously welcome Susan Clark. Um We have known each other for at least 60 possibly since the 70s. Uh, possibly, yes. When I was a grad student then. Uh, but Susan, Susan is a, is a professor of American history and women's studies and African American studies at Temple University. Uh, she is a senior, senior player in the world of American history in Philadelphia, um, which is a very, very vibrant world. Um, and um, she has been, this project bridges um, an old historiography and a new historiography. It's really quite stunning to be reminded how the connections between the work uh, that was done in the 50s and 60s, 70s um, on historical demography as people began to ask questions about what were people's lives like, what were the fundamental shaping forces of ordinary people's lives, um, and really because the evidence was a little bit scant about their own voices to look at numbers. And we did a lot of numbers, a lot of demographic work. The focus has shifted toward a more cultural approach in the last 25 years, and in the in, uh, in, in your work and your dissertation and your earlier work was on the hardcore demography of Philadelphia, and the um, uh, and her recent book, um, uh, Revolution Conceptions, uh, make sure I get this right, Women Fertility and Family Limitation in Early America, um, has straddled the quantitative and the qualitative dimension to, to make a fairly radical statement about the, the experience of the American Revolution in um, the, middle of the, 19, middle of the 18th century, many of the 18th century, but as much as that, uh, a new interpretation that in interesting ways, I think, uh, dovetails uh, with modern understandings about how fertility changes. We'll find out if we're right. Um, John Castling is going to provide our first um, uh, comment. He is um, Professor of Sociology and Director of the Initiative on Population um, Studies at Ohio State um, and has a long experience in um, studying fertility in the developing world, um, which in some measure was where historians were asking questions about that back and, and in a sense we kind of solved those questions we thought. Uh, but now we have this kind of this connection between, um, between social science and history um, and between in, in, in the world that we inhabit, between a history um, that was uh, extremely high end in the 1960s and 70s, um, that then is reinvigorated by the larger project. So <coughs> I'll take the floor soon. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got some slides with me, and, and we can talk about the art history aspects of this if you want to. But I just put up a, a picture which wasn't in the book and uh, wasn't on the uh, uh, things that were posted online. So just to give you something fresh to think about while I talk about where I think uh, my work is situated in terms of demographic theories of transition. And so I'll talk more about what I think the conclusions of my work have been. Uh, the reasons for the now worldwide shift from lifetime to limited childbearing have been much debated. Explanations for the relatively sudden switch from abundant to restricted childbearing have included the effects of diminishing land availability or rising land prices, industrialization, the market revolution, modernization, uh, the availability of non familial label, labor. Um, Productive decreasing productive contributions by children, uh, increasing literacy or educational levels, particularly for women, uh, the uh, new class formations and social identities, 
consequences of finite wage rates and salaries on family income and planning for the future, increasing female labor force participation. This is a long test. Um, domestic feminism, religious influences, uh, self-control uh, self advocated in the early 19th century, uh, growing secularization, rising life expectancy, falling infant mortality levels, <coughs> expanding social services or other governmental programs, uh, investment strategies, shifting intergenerational wealth flows, the invention of more reliable birth control techniques, greater access to abortion <coughs> providers, and more. It's a long list, right? In all these attempts to explain the shift to lower fertility, almost no one has asked what people have time thought of family size, marital relations, contraception, abortion, sons and daughters. This is what I'm trying to do here in this book, is look at some of these issues. The existing formulations, many based on English experience, fail to explain the idiosyncratic behavior of French and American couples in the 18th century. None of the current explanations I hold are entirely satisfactory. The prevailing assumptions, I think, which run through many of the attempts to explain uh, the shift from high fertility to low fertility, uh, is that men make fertility decisions, and they will make these decisions based almost entirely on simple cost benefit economic analyses. Women's perceptions have been neg have neglected, as have cultural and political influences. In the long run, lower fertility has to make economic sense, certainly. Uh, but it has to make economic sense for women as well as well as men. Uh, there is no direct support for the contention that diminishing land availability or rising land prices have uh, made the cost of establishing many sons on farms of their own prohibitive, uh, presumably forcing an unwelcome restraint on family size. Not falling fertility was enthusiastically welcomed, not forced by financial pressures and regretted. Embedded in the usual argument for the effect of land price is an assumption that parents wanted their married sons to settle near pot, nearby, that they valid, va uh, valued rootedness. There is no evidence that this is true for most Americans. Men, and to a lesser extent women, showed little discrimination in the state's foot uh, in American history. The fertility transition in the United States began well before industrialization, uh, even while industrialization in Britain occurred well before the fertility there. There is no sign that more women were working for wages in the early republic than in the colonial era. The market revolution, consumerism, and new expectations of comfort and fashion played a role in family limitation by converting funds from child rearing to more comfortable houses, genteel furnishings, and certain indulgences like books and magazines. But the reverse was true as well. Child rearing was becoming more expensive. Greater concern for each child, and especially I hold for daughters, required more extensive outlays for toys, books, clothes, bedrooms, education, and more. The consumer revolution and an increasing distaste for exploiting the labor of children <coughs> seem to have been among the key elements of these innovations of marital fertility. Other costs, including the physical cost of bearing seven or child children and women were also being calculated. There was no expansion of social services or other governmental policies that would have replaced team-based care. There were no technological breakthroughs providing more reliable birth control devices. So many of these uh, common explanations do not apply at least to the American case. Urbanization is frequently given as a factor in the move to limit birth. But what is it about early cities that promoted family limitation strategies? Was it the cost of housing, the greater weight of middling sort out attitudes in the formation of public opinion, greater literacy and skill sets needed for employment, or was it the density of women's social networks that allowed conversation, debate, and novel linkages that drew on enlightened revivalists and sensible discourses during the period of political Surviving documents, I hold, 
And there had to be a new masculinity as well, one measured by citizenship rather than lineage. Family limitation and feminism are in decline. As women gain control of their bodies, they gradually uh, gain more authority in the family. Secularism is often given as a force behind this fertility transition. But the women in the mid-Atlantic states drew up, drew up theology as well as, and perhaps even more, than on secular sources. Patriarchy and hierarchy were undermined by heartfelt religious beliefs that cannot be separated from the declarations of universal civil rights and political independence. The American revolutionaries and Republican emergent uh, and Republican and emergent democratic ideologies have sometimes been criticized for failing to extend full civil and political rights to women, for failing to make the economic changes that could have led to women's control of the wages of property, for further restricting women to domestic roles. During the revolution, some women began to assert control of their bodies to determine when and how often they would bear children to rationally and responsibly plan, like reasoning adults, the best possible futures for those children. Once they could hope to determine their futures, they might turn to the determination of career, of political candidates, of public presence. It is an unfortunate but telling aspect of the transition to plan childbearing that many women and men did not entirely reject negative female attributes that had dominated during the colonial period, but shifted irrationality, sexual excess, and unrestrained appetites from white women to women of color. But the initial discovery and embrace of fertility, despite that negative aspect, was made by literate women who had grew out of declarations of equality. So what I have done in this book is to look at and employ as many avenues to get at the uh, attitudes of women and their understanding of fertility in the 18th and early 19th century. And I've done this partially and probably primarily through history, but also through demography, medicine, law, uh, art history and other disciplines that each provide different angles of vision that help me uh, come to the conclusions I do. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing what you have to say. Thank you. Occasionally, I pay attention to what the historians are, are doing. And as a graduate student at the University of Michigan, uh, I took a course in historical demography. We were all quite excited about what the historical demography had to offer. But I will have to confess that I have not kept closely uh, up on it for the last few decades. So um, that, again, made this a really welcome opportunity for me. So um, and my own research has been so close to what Susan is grappling with that I, uh, I found 
found a lot to reflect on, a lot to uh, react to. Um, so I have one slide here. I have four slides in total, I think. Maybe it's five. Um, one slide that just tells you a bit about what I do and where I am in my own research on fertility decline in a whole different setting, that is the 20th century declines in the latter half of the 20th century in Asia, Africa, Latin America. And then I'll offer some comments that what critical things I have to say about Susan's uh, written presentation and the book, and um, we'll take it from there. Um, so, um, fertility declines outside the West, I think you're all aware there's been um, substantial declines in uh, fertility rates in uh, Asia, Africa, Latin America in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, if you go back to the immediate post-war period, uh, on average women were having, let's say, five to six children uh, over their reproductive career in virtually all countries in these regions. <coughs> Uh, and now it's in the uh, order of two to three in most countries. So it's a three to five child decline um, over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, I think kind of measure one of the really uh, consequential developments uh, over the last uh, half century in, in these regions um, it, with all sorts of consequences. Um, so the question is, how did this come about? Um, is it, is it, some would say it's not a very difficult problem at all. Some would say it's not. It is a bit of a difficult problem. The, in my um, crowd, um, over the decades, the crucial debate has been uh, kind of two counter explanations. This is a very crude debate in many ways, and some of you will find this very crude, but this is the way it's fallen out. Um, fertility declines have come about primarily because of design, uh, declines in desired number of children. That is for various reasons, and Susan listed a whole lot of them. Um, couples now want fewer children than they did in the past. Uh, or is it a matter of improved birth control? Achieving um, family sizes that were pretty much wanted all along. Um, so this has been a, the uh, big debate for decades, uh, and it's been an intense debate because actually uh, there are resources at stake. That is, uh, unlike uh, debating the American fertility decline, which is now a couple hundred years old, uh, at this point people are there's still public policy is being made um, around the issue of levels of fertility. So um, that is the there are questions how much should be spent on maternal and child health programs, how much should be spent on providing family planning services, and so on. And there's a lot of dollars at stake. Um, well, um, interesting thing is that my own recent research, and this is by the most part not yet published, it's work I'm doing at the moment, um, I've come to the conclusion, um, and I think it's, you'd have to know the literature, but I'm taking a stance that's a little bit at the extreme in terms of the current literature, that that um, the declines in desire of our children is really a very small part of the story in the last, let's say, 30 to 40 years. That the story is almost all um, improved birth control. That's what I find. Um, a bit to my surprise, by the way. I've kind of developed a new analytical approach the last couple of years that's led me to this conclusion. Um, and in particular, there's been a remarkable decline in the rates of the long child. Much more than I think is recognized. Remarkable. So that is to say, if you take women who are at risk of having an unwanted child, what's the chance they're going to have for your children? And that rate uh, has declined tremendously over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, it may be, by the way, that the, that the, that the changes in fertility desires was quite consequential in fact, but it occurred sometime earlier. My empirical research starts in the 1970s. So it could be that there was, uh, during the earlier part of the 20th century, desires in these regions that, uh, that that occurred before I start my work and then it's the second stage that I'm looking at where it's improved with birth control. So that's what I find empirically in kind of the demographic analysis. So the question I'm not grappling with is, is how did this happen that um, birth control seems to improve so much? And I certainly don't take the view that it's simply a matter that there are have suddenly been better family planning services, more access to contraception. That's part of the story. But the, um, the declines in, in unwanted childbearing uh, are so, the approved birth control is so universal that I find myself thinking about the sort of things that Susan is finding for the U.S. fertility decline. That there are uh, changing notions of, of, of self. Um, I thought the key thing here is basically a health transition, that is, a different way of dealing with the body that includes um, birth control, sexuality, includes all sorts of things. But the fertility decline is part of a larger transition towards more control of the body, um, kind of more self-efficacy about bodily things. Um, 
what Susan Cook has made me do is to step back and say, well, what about the kind of um, the greater empowerment of women to deal with their own reproduction? And is that kind of also a kind of force that could be operated here? Um, in a way that kind of transcends a lot of other boundaries. So. Okay, that's kind of my backdrop for what she does. Now, um, what Susan does, uh, you got a, a bit of it uh, from her presentation. If you look at her paper, you got her, it was attributed to the whole story. Well, here's my not, uh, uh, concise summary. Um, what's I think distinctive about her argument for me is an emphasis on the determining power of notions, of ideas, notions, ideology, uh, about, uh, first of all, uh, women's adult roles. That is what makes for a proper and fulfilling life as an adult woman. Uh, what it, how does sexuality and childbearing figure into that? Uh, in what ways? Um, so, uh, notions about sexuality in the body, and um, notions about um, what marriage, what marriage is all about, what its purpose is, what should be featured in marriage. Um, the distinction which she makes between childbearing and child rearing, this kind of transition towards the, the, the growing notion that there are proper ways to rear children. Uh, and that leads you to have fewer, you know, more than just more children. This very uh, notions about what makes a proper child rearing crystallize. Uh, and really begin to guide people's decisions. So this is all. This is kind of what this is what I think she's saying, and she can correct. Um, and these notions, in turn, are heavily influenced by various kinds of cultural currents, uh, political upheaval. And this I think what makes her are quite exciting. She's not the very first, but among the first. That she says you know, it's, it's the revolution in the U.S. and, and also in France that um, really has spread and established these notions of uh, equality, liberty, uh, in, in, in the economy. <laughs> And then, um, what about economic change, which has been the favorite, um, I would say, most of the literature? Uh, well, I think in Susan's uh, look at it, Susan's view of the U.S. fertility decline, that that's less fundamental. She doesn't dismiss it out of hand, but it's less fundamental. Okay, that's um, much of my takeaway uh, situation of her part. Now, I have some concerns, three concerns, I'll present to you, and uh, I'll say again. Um, Susan may well just maybe very quickly say, well, if you've read the whole book carefully, <laughs> you wouldn't um, misconstrue my argument this way. Uh, first thing, um, and I know Susan's been around this, I don't know what she's going to say, but uh, there's a question about when the U.S. fertility decline actually began. And Susan dates it to the late uh, 1800s, um, late, late 18th century, that is someplace 1780. Things, things began to change, um, rather than in the mid-19th century. But um, I think that the demographic literature, as far as I can tell, again, I don't work in this country, but I think the demographic literature I trust would say that the onset of marital fertility decline, that is, change childbearing, change reproductive behavior within a marriage, within a reproductive union, <coughs> that actually did not begin as early as Susan says. It began about a half century. So I think she's dated the decline wrong. Um, except there was decline in U.S. fertility in the period 1800 to 1850, I think it, it looks like it's almost, almost entirely to that shadow of changing the marriage. And I'll say something more about that in a moment. But this, by the way, would be consistent with the economic if that's true, that that early decline was about getting married and what age people married and how many didn't marry. Now, um, so, this takes us to this classic distinction between motives versus means. Because I believe Susan's got it right that she presents so much material, it has to be there were some changing sensibilities and changing mentalities about reproduction and women's lives. It is back to the 18th century. Um, so if we talk about motives versus means, we, we could um, can see that fundamental and deep change did occur before um, the, the latter half of the 19th century, probably as early as Susan. But then, my argument is the water for the means to, um, to implement those new motives, to actually carry them through successfully. Uh, the means, there may have been efforts, but we're not up to the task. This has a really interesting chapter where she goes through various methods of contraception, abortion, and so forth, that, were, that you can find that there was evidence that people were attempting to use. Um, but I think the demographic data shows that whatever efforts were made, they weren't successful. It simply weren't successful, and it was only the latter part of the 19th century, so it's 
success was achieved. Um, is this uh, is this is this kind of a fatal flaw in her argument? Well, I don't think so, actually. Um, <clears throat> So I think the motives, the change in motives, the change in, in, in feelings about family size is profound and essential. And I think it also could be the case that there were behavioral changes, real efforts towards um, having fewer children <coughs> investing more in them, um, that may not have actually translated into lower fertility rates. So uh, it may be frustrating kind of efforts, like effectual efforts. But the fact that efforts were being made is itself a, a, a social change of profound. Quite a lot of importance. Okay, but anyway, my first point is I think uh, some of the demography here is fundamentally the fault. <clears throat> Second, um, in kind of following a point I made in the first slide, how do we regard a marriage change? Um, some demographic, I'm, I'm wondering how Susan actually regards nuptiality uh, in her general argument. And I suspect this is where a close reading the book would have answered this question for me. So some demographic, demographic analysis suggests that much of the early fertility decline in the U.S., let's say before 1850, was due to less marriage. Um, that is later age of first marriage, I'm older than so ever married. I'm not quite sure how this fits into your argument. I'd like to hear her say something about that. That is, her argument is clearly about how married couples are relating to each other and what women are doing within marriages. Uh, and, and really, there's this change in how uh, sexuality reproduction is handled. Between the there, you know. um, and with this new kind of emphasis on autonomy, independence, liberty, uh, and a new view that uh, unrestrained childbearing is improper, uh, that you should have uh, some kind of control of your life and that you can do better for your children, and women can do other things with their time, all this. But it all refers, in my mind, refers to what happens within marriage. Um, is, uh, Less marriage um, also part of the whole story here. It's a part of her argument. So can less marriage be attributed to forces, new notions of liberty, equality, and sensibility? So that's it. Because it looks like the marriage change is an important part of the story demographically. Um, I don't know what it says about women's changing lives in this period. Finally, uh, the, the question I had, and I say she's answered it in various places in the right. Is where do men fit in? Um, so it looks like what happened in the U.S., is what I can tell from demographic literature, is that there was a decline in uh, <coughs> childbearing starting in the mid-19th century. Uh, and the approximate cause, I mean, how it was achieved, was probably uh, withdrawal as a method of contraception. Uh, is and or um, sexual abstinence, just so, so abstaining from sex uh, for periods of time. Um, well, um, <coughs> Her story is mainly about women and um, how they have taken control of their lives, but if this is how it occurred, um, withdrawal and sexual abstinence, then men are collaborative in some sense. Um, and I'm trying to figure out where they do fit in the story. For um, are they willing to collaborate? Um, if so, uh, for what reason? Um, have men bought into this ideology that if women's uh, adult married lives should be different? Should it be so... Uh, Totally overwhelmed by childbearing, men bought in. Uh, are they willing collaborators because of new economic calculus, microeconomic calculus? That kids are just uh, we're bringing the household down. Too many kids bring your household down for economic, in the economic sense. Um, or are they perhaps unwilling collaborators? Um, and if so, how is this achieved? How do you have uh, less childbearing due to um, withdrawal and sexual abstinence? Collaborate. Well, we can imagine ways that might happen. Um, maybe they're um, kind of unwilling, but they still cooperate in some sense. Uh, or perhaps there's some new unilateral <coughs> action on the part of women. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how they all work. Okay. Uh, so, okay, those are my comments. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I will say I uh, found the book immensely uh, stimulating, and I hope we're going to, I hope Susan has a chance to march us through these portraits and paintings that were distributed. But she has a great story to tell about. Uh, if you all didn't, I don't know, if you maybe had to read the book, uh, but uh, there's a great story about changing port, uh, portrayal of women over a three or four decade period. So I think it really should be shown to the audience. So, how do you want to handle this? Uh, do you want to quickly zip through the book? Or back to the book? Well, maybe just briefly say what I think, and then... Uh,
uh, we can open up. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to thank John for his comments. His book on uh, diffusion was an important influence on my book. So uh, uh, we, I think we uh, share a lot of the same ideas here. Uh, but he does raise three issues. One is when. And uh, he says that, uh, and he's right, that I, I trace the origins to the last quarter or last third of the 18th century, and the evidence on a national level would place measurable decline in the middle of the 19th century. My response to this is primarily you can't, there's a danger of looking only at the national level because there are two regions in the United States which lag considerably behind in this movement that I'm talking about in the mid-Atlantic states. That is the Deep South and the Far West. And in those areas, high fertility persisted well after uh, Eastern women were beginning to uh, <coughs> in some respects, for my purposes, um, rather unimportant, because I want to know why women started this and when that change occurred, and it seems to be a pretty dramatic change. And if the technology is limiting, that doesn't tell us anything about the drive that women had and some men had to um, reduce mobility. So I, I say that. Um, nationality. Uh, there is a rise in marriage rates. Um, nobody has. You mean age. Um, um, yeah, marriage age. Um, I'm not. I don't know that there is a substantial decline in marriage rates. That is, that nuptiality declines enough to account for the for the falling family size. Uh, I mean, the evidence that I have shows uh, earlier ages of last birth. Um, Facing hurdles, uh, and so I'd say there are other things going on, and I don't think it's entirely male-dominated technologies which are being employed. I think uh, the lung breastfeeding, among other things, uh, is going on. I think abortion is more prevalent than uh, we may have thought otherwise. So uh, I would not confine. Um, Technology to just quite uh, interrupt us or, or other male dominated procedures. Uh, the role of men. The role of men, I think, varied. Uh, some men were supportive, some men were not. Some men took over, adopted the idea of lower fertility and asserted uh, control over women's bodies in yet another way than they had done before. So uh, there is a range of behaviors rather than a It's a rare example. Very few portraits of children were made in the colonial period. Okay. 
Well, first you could look at the fact that the male children are in front of the female child. Yes. Okay, so the, the, the girl is in back. The daughter is in back. How are the boys clothed? Who's posture? That's a good year. Well, they're very dominant men in positions that you can see them painted this way in their 40s or 50s as they're painted in their, yeah. their adolescence here. And she's the same way. She's in the background. She's got a flower. She's tightening her own arms together. Yeah. Very submissive. Okay. There's hand on the hips. Uh, art historians call this the Renaissance elbow. <laughs> and it goes back to uh, to the older Western tradition that this kind of posture is male dominant. That, you know, you're showing your dominance over your subordinates uh, by putting your hand on your hip like that. I was going to say all these kids look relatively close to the same age group. You know, you don't see a lot of like super older children, super younger children. They all look within the same relative time period. Yeah, they uh, they do look pretty much. Uh, they're, they're, one of the things, if you look at 18th century censuses, is that they way undercount infants and especially girls. And so uh, this may be part of the reason why only the older children are, are shown. Uh, so this is part of it. Well, what's the flower that the girl is holding to symbolize? Flowers uh, reproduction. And so she's got a reproductive future ahead of her. So maturity. So you're talking this is maturity. I mean, it's maturity and reproductivity. Yeah, well, okay. That could work. That could work. Uh, the other question is where are the eyes focused? The only one who's not repeating at the viewer. Yeah. yeah, right. So the boys look right at the viewer, and the girl does not. She looks away. So, as one who's an art historian has said, in the few colonial portraits of children we have, we're <coughs> that number of girls by 50%. So we've got an exact replica of that larger scale. So I thought I'd put this up as one example. One of the problems with doing the research, as we talked about with some of you uh, over lunch, is that a lot of colonial portraits were just copied. So you have the original English uh, portrait on the top. There, it was made into an engraving. It was circulated widely in the British Empire. And here is a Copley, I think it's Copley portrait of uh, that same woman with the same spaniel and the same dress uh, and the same hairstyle in the colonies. And uh, other than telling us that the col colonials emulated British fashion, it doesn't tell us much about the colonies. Uh, here's a sort of transition piece. You have uh, a duchess of the Duchess over there, and she's got a basket of flowers, and uh, she's placing it on an altar to the king. You can see the crown on the altar. Um, she stands up, and then we find uh, New York City, some uh, copy, obviously influenced by the portrait of the Duchess of uh, Bolton, uh, but with some differences. Uh, whereas the Duchess is, uh, is standing up and assertive, uh, 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 Philip Franks is seated on a bench here, um, and she has moved the basket of flowers much closer to her body, so it becomes self-identifying with the flowers rather than dumping the flowers on the altar of the king. So this indicates something that I think is significant. 
And then in the 1740s, 1750s, and 1760s, you get a, a spate of, of female portraits from the colonies in which women, unlike what's going on in Britain at the same time, uh, have these baskets of flowers or sometimes fruit held at their lower, lower torso, uh, indicating uh, their fecundity. The most common time for a woman to have a portrait painted in the colonies was at her marriage. So uh, these are predictions of sexual availability and of fertility. Uh, this is a, a young woman who uh, is not married. Uh, she has peaches and pears in her basket. Um, she offers a peach to the viewer. Uh, she is peach colored herself. So she is fruit ready to be plucked. Um, and so she, we know she married about three years later. So it's obviously a successful portrait. <laughs> One of my favorites for talking about the fecund attributes uh, given to women in colonial paintings, uh, you find once again the basket of fruit, displayed legs, and then you have here what looks to me like a human body. The arms here, the head here, arm here, body here, legs here. So they actually portray her as if she were giving birth. Um, and the uh, flowing out of the basket of abundant flowers. Um, here is a, another Copley painting. Um, this is a woman in her 40s, but we know from other sources she was pregnant at the time this painting was taken. She has her legs spread apart and a bunch of grapes spill from her body as if she is giving birth. The stuff, stuff seems very <coughs> indecent for us, I think, even in our rather crude age. Um, but this is how colonial women were portrayed. And if we had better view, you could see in the background that workers are out in the fields making the hay um, because it's harvest season. and so. The bounty of agriculture and the bounty of the female body are identical here and both promise a uh, profit for the husband who probably paints the thing. Uh, here's an even more explicit public painting. Uh, as uh, the art historians notice, everything in this picture is rounded. The table is round, the fruit is round. This is gold plate is round. <laughs> um, and we know she has 14 children in her life. And so her appetite for sexuality must have been prodigious. Uh, and we see the attacks on women's bodies, which were commonplace during the revolution when it was customary to portray nations as females. Uh, this is one of the, of the kinds of popular prints that circulated wild, uh, widely during the uh, revolution. Here's another uh, rather indecent one of a witch-like woman with her genitals aflame. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that maybe women were reacting to in part, not just high-minded calls to, for liberty and quality, but rejection of this kind of portrayal. Uh, after the revolution, most of the uh, <coughs> fruit and flowers disappear, except in one genre of art, and that is the state and city seals. This happens to be the seal of the city of Philadelphia, but uh, about half the states have very similar uh, motifs in their official seals. And here you see two slightly pregnant women uh, with the cornucopia uh, 
promising a fruitful uh, future for the city of Philadelphia. And so it seems to me that what's going on here is the aspects that were um, previously embodied in uh, the family and in the patrilineal descent are now being transferred to the citizen of the state. And so it's the state that's prosperity, not individual women carrying lots of children. Uh, and here's an example of the new kinds of portrait. Uh, for the first time, children are, are commonly portrayed in portraits, including infants and others. And the, the greedy reaching after fruit and, that we see sometimes in colonial portraits are, are now associated with children and infants. And so women rise above that sort of uh, excessive, uncontrolled, irrational uh, 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 appetite and are now uh, in control and adult like men are adult. Uh, and in fact, in family portraits, women frequently are to the foreground and men are to the background. And again, you have the children, the little children, uh, behaving like children, and but the, uh, the older girl is aligned with the adults and is therefore certainly <coughs> more rational uh, and in control of itself. So these are just some of the the uh, ways that I have interpreted uh, visual evidence to find out some aspects of what's going on. Um, this goes back to some of the comments made about your paper, but the idea of improved birth control and separating that from motives, it seems that you would have to have the motive to want to use the birth control in order for any sort of improved birth control to be effective. Can you really separate means and motives? Well, the point's well taken. I guess the yes, the, um, the motives are the prerequisite. Uh, I don't know if you made the point. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah, I, I accept that. So I don't mean to say that uh, either one can operate in, well, exclusively independently of the other and have any sort of outcome. Throw one.
and it's a favorite of um, not so much academics, but certainly of the, those in the policy arena. To the extent that I've become a, felt a bit over the top about this, uh, it's because, um, but it, um, it's, the empirical association is quite strong. The debate actually okay. in, in the literature uh, in my field has been the issue of whether it's the, the schooling of adult women who are of child, childbearing age, or is it the schooling of children that's kind of a key transition. Of course, this, the first falls from the latter. You don't have uh, adult women who have it in schooling unless you earlier had childhood in school. But there is an argument um, that the key point is, is, is that when have mass schooling, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's, it's recognized that children need to go to school uh, for their future, for your family's well-being, um, and that then all of a sudden the, um, the cost of child uh, rearing escalates hugely, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we can put just to have fewer children. Mm -hmm. But another kind of argument, more consistent with Susan's argument, is that it's the, it's the adult. It's a school. It's having education among adult women that has changed their lives change their conception of themselves, has uh, given them various kinds of autonomy and leverage. Um, so that would be actually a, if you could break schooling into parts, that would be a, a, a debate. Is it adult women's schooling versus children's schooling? Um, was there any, uh, like you, you talked about right at, uh, at the revolutionary period, there was a, a takeover by women of the reproductive rights. When would you say the entrance into the public sphere for women occurred, like after this? Well, it, it, it's a, grad, it's a okay. gradual process. Um, there's, a, a, there's an important book by uh, Karen Wilson, uh, uh, Lucky, Milton Martha Moore's book, and they talk about how women in the middle of the 18th century are creating their own kind of public sphere by circulating documents and starting their own schools for girls and using the, the manuscript books that they create as textbooks in these schools so that they're controlling both text and, and opinion within that kind of a public, though it's not the usual kind of definition of what the public is. Um, and so there is that going on in Philadelphia and other places there's dense populations. Um, and so there's that. But, you know, by 1800, by 1810, the second grade awakening, women are increasingly involved, going around knocking on doors, trying to convert the unconverted, establishing Sunday schools, printing pamphlets. So they're moving fairly rapidly after the period I'm talking about into what we would consider the real activities, printing, and so on, and uh, it follows from there that they get into reform activities and uh, new occupations for women and a whole host of changes from within that first half century of the 19th century. And I, I would argue that that timing of why women are suddenly doing all these things which they hadn't done before is that they're increasingly in terms of, you talk about how there's a sort of a pre-revolutionary and a post-revolutionary form of portraiture. So for example, among slave-owning families, do you see a similar shift in portraiture or in sort of portraiture? What, or, or in, in any of your sources? Like what's going on in terms of the minority groups that are resisting this? I wish we knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and on the lower end, we have almost no evidence of the mm -hmm. war and of okay. African Americans. There are a number of books on African American reproduction in the 19th century. Uh, not nothing for the 18th century. You look at the record and it's just like an occasional wisp of, of information that, is, as far as I've been able to discover, is not enough to write an article about. 
So uh, there, it is, it is just unknown. Uh, now maybe somebody with better research skills can find that information. But it, it's ironic. Um, most of the evidence we have come, comes from the very elite. Um, they left the best records, they had descendants who saved their papers, they found the historical societies to save those papers. Uh, they, had, they were the ones who paid for the paintings. Um, uh, and yet they're not as uh, avid a supporter of these changes as those slightly below them, the middle class. Um, or, as far as I can tell, To start out with, that um, the rational north, and I would presume that in the rational south, but I'm not sure how irrational it was if you're going to have a slave system. Ultimately, the North is going to be much different than the South. I, I, New England was actually much more advanced than the Atlantic, so the Atlantic was sort of the embrace of this new ideology. Uh, and the fertility crop is much faster than the Atlantic. 
I've seen some figures that indicate that women died much earlier than men in the colonial period. And often, of course, that was because of childbirth. Have you uh, looked at when that figure changed and what that might have been? I mean, for a woman, the childbearing was extraordinarily dangerous in that time period. Yeah, it was. Uh, the, best, the best figures I've seen are for Lancaster County yesterday. And they said women 15 to 15 had a 40 percent chance higher Um, well, you described the uh, fertility transition as uh, anti-authoritarian. Yeah. Um, but I wondered if if this is happening in a, a Republican mother framework, is could it also be seen as happening within the bounds of a patriarchal society? So that you know the um, the anti-authoritarian like uh, women political activists in the early republic, as well as the Republican motherhoods that are you know uh, accepting this patriarchal values, are they both part of this transition? Um, equally. I, I just wondered if you... Yeah, well, I would say that anti-authoritarianism is a very gradual progress, process. And you're moving from a patriarchal system, patrilineal, patrilocal, to a, <coughs> to a system, used to be called separate spheres, where women have authority in the home and men are going outside by the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s to work. And uh, so women have a place, a locus of authority. Are they still under their husbands? Yes. Do they still have to vote? No. Do they, you know, a whole host of things are still stacked against them. But compared to the earlier system where children belong to the husband and uh, women had no control over anything, uh, even the household. You sort of addressed it to me, her point about kind of um, coerced uh, in contemporary or historically or contemporary. Well, first of all, your first point there, uh, the other side, that uh, it is contraception of choice, this kind of thing. And of course, we know that uh, for many women, that it's not an option, various kinds of obstacles. But then you also pointed to the opposite, that it's, uh, it's, it's forced from women. Um, and with instances of last. I would say in a whole, by some, some means of counting, those instances have been very rare. However, a couple of the instances are, are in the demographic giants of China and India. No question, China had a period of time, a decade or two, when there was a lot of course of abortion and contraception. And India, uh, in the mid-70s, had uh, sterilization campaigns that had coercive elements to them. I don't know if I felt like I could speak to that. And, um, <coughs> Up to the, in the present in India, with this very interesting phenomenon, um, my grand student Tree and I have talked about this. It's now a very common phenomenon. Uh, in, when the, it, it, sterilization is a very common method of, of contraception in India presently. Actually, has been for decades, but presently. And um, a lot of it occurs at rather young ages, like by the mid to late 20s. So, the phenomenon of women having a couple of children and becoming sterile before age 30. It is not a trivial phenomenon, it's really showed in the demographic survey. Um, the extent to which that's voluntary or chosen, I think it's something really ought to be investigated. I think somebody probably is, but I haven't been reading it. But I don't think it's very well investigated. I 
hear anecdotally um, from the work and reproductive health in India uh, asserting that there's women aren't really happily making this choice, but it's being made by somebody for them. So, um, so it's not coerced in the crudest way, but it may be coerced in another kind of a less direct way. But that is a phenomenon I think would really merit some investigation on um, how women are feeling about having their reproductive lives terminated before age 30 by the 20th and something. Maybe the answer is it's quite fine, but you do wonder. Just add it, I wonder if this is also pointing us towards thinking about the relationship between choice and coercion as sort of not too dichotomous. Clear. I mean, there are obviously cases of clear coercion, but I think, you know, I've been reading about sort of new uh, theories about Kerala in India, which is seen as like this model of development that's been critiqued as a lot of the fertility decline being sort of distress related, right? The result of falling living standards. Where would we put that? on this model of choice and coercion doesn't suit that very well. Um, women may well be making a choice on an individual level, but it's also one that's, you know, incredibly constrained by a variety of other factors. So, you know, I, I think that that we can't just sort of draw those lines so starkly around choice.
I have a question about um, the historical understanding of abortion during this time. My understanding is that abortion was had a whole lot less sort of moralizing about it during the time that you're talking about. And I'm thinking about it in the context of having fewer choices around fertility control. Now, in the current political debate, you'll, you'll hear even people who are sympathetic to a choice for abortion will, will say, people should really use family planning. They shouldn't have gotten pregnant in the first place. But I guess if they've done this mistake, you know, abortion is still there. And I wonder whether there was less sort of moralizing around that in the respect that there were not a whole host of technologic options to control fertility. And so amongst, particularly amongst women themselves, if there was a, an unwanted pregnancy, there was sort of less, less stigma, less moralizing around, um, around terminating those pregnancies. Uh, that's true, but it, it's also in a context in which there's not a lot known about human reproduction the basic biology. A very different understanding of the body, uh, different understanding of the illness, um, and so it's, yes, there was what we would call abortion was practiced commonly, uh, but they did not classify it that way. And so, by classifying certain conditions as illness, you obviate any moral questions. <coughs> Some of it is willful ignorance, and some of it is real ignorance uh, of the body. Well, about that, how did the uh, discovery of female egg, like reproductive cell, how did it affect um, fertility rights and fertility rights in America? Uh, I'm not sure when is when is the early 1800s. Well, I think it's certainly a factor that, that when it percolates down to the public, and it sometimes takes these abstract, pure scientific discoveries a while to reach the public, certainly one of the factors. If you could talk a little bit more about some of the strategies women could employ to reduce fertility in the late 18th century and early 19th century, and so so John's arguing that you know technology is really is really important. You're saying even even in an era of limited technology, women still had a variety of options to deploy. Because I, when I read your essay, I was thinking a lot about how marriage in the late 18th centuries. Um, and it's all this literature on sensibility, um, literature on the arguments about companionate marriage, affectionate marriage, people are marrying out of love. Well, you know, in some ways, this, this campaign to control female fertility, if it's, if it's relying on abstinence and withdrawal, is actually desexualizing marriage, is severely limiting men's, you know, uh, rights to marital sex, um, is making marriage less about sex, or, or, or certainly is going to affect the frequency of sex within marriage. And, just wondering how women talked about that aspect of, of uh, sexuality in marriage as it's tied into all these other, these new arguments about emotion, um, sensibility, etc. Companionship as part of marriage. Well, it is a conflict. Uh, and I do find evidence that after the revolution, some married couples did try abstinence. It didn't work. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it was a total failure in every case that I've seen. Um, but yeah, it, it does put strains on marriage, even if people are trying unsuccessfully to be celibate or to reduce the incidence of marital intercourse. Um, I think one of the consequences may be that there's a rapid expansion of prostitution at the same time, and so that may be one, one feedback loop that's happening because of this. Um, there is also a commercialization of abortion uh, to make it more readily available. Pharmaceutical companies 
start pushing things like the sponge and uh, various hazardous herbicidal uh, gels and so on from the 1820s or thereabouts. Uh, so there are those alternatives. Uh, uh, most, mostly what people talk about in the 18th century are herbal remedies, stuff you can buy in you know, these uh, health stores. Uh, today, uh, various herbs that would make you vomit and give you diarrhea and uh, presumably uh, also eliminate any fetal fetus that you're carrying. So it's more about abortifacients rather than trying to, rather than limiting sexual contact, essentially. Right, yeah. And uh, I mean, there were uh, condoms. But they were associated with prostitution and prevention of venereal disease in our town economy. So that seemed not to have been used, even though it would have been available. Uh, so, various methods. I mean, it, it seems like these couples in the, in the wake of the revolution are trying anything they can think of. Uh, they go to Earth and they try this Earth and that Earth combinations of, you know, women throw themselves down stairs and they, uh, they jump off walls and they go horseback riding and they jump rope and they do all sorts of things uh, to try to turn them into unwanted pregnancies. So, none of the signs. Most of the time, and sometimes it's in the work. I'd be interested in what, what is thought about withdrawal You say in your book people don't like to write about these things, so it's probably hard to get evidence and yeah. letters and so forth. But um, you could imagine if that's perceived as kind of a pretty bad thing for marital relations or not. Yeah. I think it can go either way. Um, but it is thought that uh, you know that I, that, that was the direct means that most of the European fertility decline was achieved, was withdrawn. So, and the demographers have done these kind of simulation analyses. You can actually achieve a lot of fertility decline. You can end up with rather small family size of fertility just relying on, on withdrawal. It's really a pretty effective method. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to friends trying to avoid pregnancies, but it's a pretty effective method in the aggregate. Um, still used, by the way, there's a stretch of countries um, from Turkey, I have a question, Turkey, uh, Syria, West Asia, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, uh, all the way over to Pakistan. Um, Probably Afghanistan, but we don't have data. It's still a pretty popular method in that region. And a couple of those countries, Lebanon and Turkey, very low fertility. Now, it's not the only uh, method of uh, abortion. But um, withdrawal can be a, a route uh, directly means towards a pretty small average family size. But what people think about it, what their thoughts are, uh, if they value sexuality in a marriage, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You don't find, you can't find uh, I thought, I've, I've run across one reference to it, and that was from New England in a case where a man was accused of rape, and he said, it couldn't be my child because I might need my pullback. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only reference I've seen. It doesn't tell me much about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of the language, apparently. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. like, yeah. 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 the term for it. Well, what about, I mean, we were talking about this earlier today about the, the, uh, the pills and the, every single newspaper you <laughs> read, and I've been reading most of the New York State newspapers, not South Carolina newspapers, but every single newspaper you read is filled with ads, at least one ad a week, or not one ad, you know, um, uh, uh, you know uh, like most of the newspapers, but you know, women's complaints, Dr. Hooper's pills, Dr. So-and-so's pills, these are available at the pharmacy. How, much, how many of these are aimed at dealing with subtly yeah. terminated pregnancies. I think a lot of them are subtle indications that they're supposed to be important cases. But I can say it. 
This is a very good question, and um, uh, to talk about it, so it's something that hasn't uh, come up so far um, in, the, in the short paper so that uh, you mentioned the religion. And um, I'm not sure if you agree with that, you say this is an sort of evangelical minister to uh, say that you know, go, go out and be fruitful doesn't necessarily mean have lots of children, it means sort of, you know, make lots of money or, 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 other, sort of, or other things. Um, in the age of atonement, Boyd uh, Hilton sort of says what well, we evangelicals and causes. Changes to everything from the economy to geology, so we wouldn't talk about sexual practices. So, how would you perhaps talk about that? Well, George Whitfield, you know, is traveling everywhere. He's right. in Britain, he's in, in the American colonies, and one of his printed sermons says, you know, he, he urges people to go out and be fruitful and multiply. And then he says, he does, he says in what? In every good deed and action. So it was about. It, They do it without being secular. They do it in a religious construct of looking out for other people, helping their sisters and their daughters and the next generations live better lives. And it's, it's, it's sort of a question really about these questions about abortion and about abortion. Um, just because it was a sort of big category that women sometimes, it seems that you're talking about some of them are willfully committing abortion. Some of them are committing abortion without being aware of it. They just think they're sick and they need to induce menstruation. Um, so I'm wondering that if you could just sort of flesh out where abortion fits into your argument about change over time, the moment of the desire to reduce, um, to reduce family size. Do you, can you find any evidence that more and more women and more and more men are thinking about abortion as a thing that they want to actually uh, yeah, I think I think in the colonial period, women are investing all sorts of herbs and minerals and jumping and horseback riding and all the rest of that stuff, uh, and they cast it in terms of improving the health. Uh, after the American Revolution in the 1780s and 1790s, they start talking about using the fertility. So they 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 have the best music.